Well, we're here at the Shelter Rock Jewish Center, and we're just going to kind of take a little preliminary footage before we start uh, speaking. So the Bulgarian Jews actually uh, survived. The Macedonian people did not. But that was the thing, and by the way, I just happened to write, write about this here because when I did this piece for Congress mm -hmm. Monthly, there was a wonderful response from Alfred Lieberthal, who was saying, well, yes, you know, this is good, and I, I really don't want to, you know, this is important, but what about Bulgaria? Mm -hmm. And there's always this belief that Bulgaria saved everyone, but Bulgaria did not because they deported from Macedonian the trace. Yes, exactly. About twenty-five thousand. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Well, of course. So that leaves Albania as the only that's country that's that Macedonia. Right. Yeah. But from trace, also the combination right. was about twenty-five thousand people. And he got sixty million. Sixty million. The other left. That's Mr. Sampson, who we met at B'nai B'rith for the last two years at the UN, and in fact, he's being blocked right now by someone. Let me see if I can get over here. Yeah, okay. There we can just about see his face, Bob Sampson. Right. Okay, and then we have a nice gathering of people coming to hear Shirley and me speak about rescue in Albania. So it is my privilege to introduce our guest speakers. And as you know, just, uh, uh, former Congressman Joseph Diogati and Shirley Cloyes Diogati, a distinguished married couple, each of whom independently and both together have a biological background of incredible intelligence, influence, involvements, perspectives, achievements, and activities, which you, you will hear about this morning. We will hear about it. It's our pleasure to have you both. Thank you. Thank and you. here this morning, <laughs> and we warmly welcome you. I shall briefly describe to you both, both of our speakers individually. The Honorable Joseph Diabati was born and raised in the Bronx, graduated from Fordham University with honors in 1962, and was a practicing CPA who served 22 years with the international accounting firm of Arthur Anderson and Company. He became the first practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the United States Congress. He was the first member of Congress to bring the issue of Albanian rights in the Balkans to the attention of the U.S. government through a congressional resolution that he sponsored as a new member of the House of Representatives in 1986. He is the founding volunteer president of the Albanian American Civic League, which is the only registered grassroots lobby representing the concerns and interests in Washington, D.C. of Albanian 750,000 approximately Albanian Americans. He and Shirley have made many visits to the areas involved and to uh, Israel where they attended a ceremony at Yad Vashem honoring the saving role of Albanians during the Holocaust. Shirley Cloyes Diabwadi was raised in uh, Westfield, New Jersey and has a phenomenal scholastic background. She graduated with a degree in sociology from Oberlin College and a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in New York City. She studied Indonesian language at the University of California at Berkeley and then taught for two years at Satya Wakana University in Central Java, where she directed a program on interethnic relations and development. She has written and lectured widely about the Balkan conflict and is the Balkan Affairs Advisor to the Albanian American Civic League, a position she has held since 1995. She's been enormously involved with members of Congress to bring lasting peace and stability to the Balkans. She created a videotape project on the role that Albanians played in rescuing every Jew who lived in Albania or sought asylum there during the Nazi Holocaust. She's an author and has been involved in publishing. What I just described about 
each of our speakers does not even come close to the many, many activities in which they have been involved and still are involved, individually and as a couple. They are remarkable. Their bio is sensation. And ladies and gentlemen, friends, it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Joseph D. Water and his wonderful, wonderful wife, Sherry And it's a pleasure for us to be here. Shirley will follow me. We'll, we'll do this separately because we wanted to divide it in a logical way. Um, but I wanted to say that we have been very active with Jewish organizations. Certainly I have because I represented Westchester County, New York. 46 synagogues in my district. I visited every one of them as a congressman. I didn't care whether it was Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, uh, but I wanted the Jewish people to know who I was, even though we may have differed on certain issues. Uh, you have to look at the human side, especially today. Don't get caught up in party labels. Look at the person. My wife's a registered Democrat, I'm a registered Republican. We got married, we lived together. I told that to my constituents. If I can live with a Democrat, you can vote for me. <laughs> a liberal Democrat, besides. The point is that you, you need to understand America is in trouble. And I do most of my speaking, not on this issue, uh, but on the issue of fiscal responsibility, public accountability in Washington, because we're spending money we don't have, we borrow from countries that don't share our values, and there's a tsunami going on the next generation that is not fair. We're back to taxation without representation. The next generation still to be born will be born with a mortgage that is certainly going to be as subprime as anything you've seen. Because we now have 12 trillion as of the end of the fiscal year. We're going to have 20 trillion, they say, within 10 years. And that's not the bad news. That's the good news. The bad news is that Social Security and Medicare are not included in that. And that's another $45 trillion for people who are living today has to be paid. Where are we going? My father would not have bought the house and move from the Bronx, we had a grocery store, we had a grand conference, if he didn't have the money in the bank, he refused to borrow it. Look what we've done now, giving mortgages to people who have their jobs, they don't ask for income statements, just to gain the system to make money, greed. Now, whatever your spiritual background is, you know, I guess love permeates everything we do, if you believe in God, as I do, surely it does, and, and you do. But we have to understand that part of that love has to be, in a way, conserving this beautiful country for the future. And we're not doing that, okay? I'll come back and speak again on that subject alone, and you can have my book, Unaccountable Congress, It Doesn't Add Up, a CPA's perspective from the inside, why you're not seeing the real information. Mm -hmm. Government is lying to you, collectively. They don't want you to know the real national debt, the real deficits. Now that I have your attention, <laughs> Let me tell you that. I am so pleased to be here, uh, and thank you, uh, Bob Sampson, for bumping into us twice at the B'nai B'rith uh, events uh, in New York City, uh, at the, I think it was for the Kodak Company, Human Rights, their record on Human Rights, the other one was at the UN, and if everything goes well, because we know Dan Mariachi very well, we visited him many times in Washington, Shirley and I should be speaking on January 27th at the UN, hasn't been confirmed yet, because we have things, we haven't stopped on this issue. We have found things that are so incredible, you don't even know. You're gonna feel it's incredible just to hear what we're telling you today that you don't know. But there's stuff we have not announced yet. But Yad Vashem already knows about it, uh, because they granted the first righteous uh, award to an Albanian from Kosovo this year, all right? So Kosovo plays a big role in what you're going to hear, and Shirley will tell you about that. Don't forget, Kosovo has two million Albanians. Well, two million people, 95% of whom are Albanians, okay? And I'm going to give you a little jargon. So now, let's go back to how this came about. You might say, Dio Boy, that's a beautiful Italian name. And it is beautiful. It comes right from the Latin, Dio, God, Guardi, Protect. So every time you say my name, you're saying a prayer, and you don't know it. God protects, okay? 
So I got to Congress, and I didn't know when I was being raised in the Bronx, in an Italian-American neighborhood, that my father was speaking, don't forget, he came here, well, you don't know, he came here in 1929, speaking two languages. I now know, Italian and Albanian, not a word of English. 15 years of age, 29, bad time, they lived in Harlem, and uh, thank God he was resourceful enough, they were farmers, who comes here? Not the elite, but the people looking for jobs in the farming class. My father had no education. Fourth grade in Italy. My mom, she had eighth grade. She had to work on the lines for producing pies for Brooks Brothers with her four sisters. They couldn't go to high school. This was America, as, as I heard from them. I wish the young people today understand what built this country. People like that struggling. And they got together, they got married, they had a grocery store in the Bronx. I was raised pretty much in the back of that grocery store. I had to go there after high school. Many times in the morning, my dad was not feeling well. I had to go with him four, three, four o'clock in the morning to load the truck at the Bronx Terminal Market by the Yankee Stadium. So you might say I'm the oldest of three. I was the one that really was raised European in my family. And that's a great bridge to have, to, to be raised with that discipline and to come here and then go to Congress. I feel I have something special to offer, especially the young people, about what, what they have to do. Now, when I got to Congress, uh, nobody knew that my family had this Albanian background. And in fact, in this Italian-American neighborhood, uh, I noticed that my father would be shifting the way he spoke to his grandma, to my grandmother. We lived with her until I was six. And I always knew my grandmother didn't have an education. There was something about the Turks, but she couldn't explain it. I kept asking her as I got more curious as I grew up, can you get me a book? I want to read this story about how you say you got to Italy and it was the Turks. Well, my first fundraiser as a congressman on my birthday in September 20th, 1985, my father was alive, my mother was alive, and they were proud. I'm you know, now a congressman representing Westchester County. And my father brought his family with him. And he was overheard speaking his language, which I thought was a fancy dialect of Italian to Albanians from Yugoslavia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro. And they came running up to me. They were brought there by uh, an Irish-American who was finance chairman for me, uh, Bill Casson, now deceased, and he had them working for him on his construction jobs. And they came up, Joe, your, your father's speaking in Albanian. We thought you were Italian. We came here to support you anyway, but what's this all about? He said, well, you know, I know in my family, going back, there's this Albanian heritage. My grandmother tried to tell it to me, and, and I guess, you know, it may go back to the Roman times. And I, no, no, you're from Kosovo. <clears throat> Kosovo? Where's Kosovo? And would you believe it? They came to my house in Scarsdale every week with books, with letters, with information to empower me. And I realized that I was discovering my, real, my family's real roots. Although my parents were born in Italy, well, my mother's Italian from Bari. My father, believe it or not, comes from the Albanians who fled the Ottoman Turks in the year 1488 when the Turks overran Albania. It's the Albanians that saved the rest of Europe from being Islamic. Why are the Albanians today in Albania 90% Muslim, uh, in, in Kosovo 90% Muslim, and 70% in Albania? And by the way, they were forcibly converted. They were all Christian. 600 years ago. You probably don't know that. And they've lived in, in, in great tolerance with all religions, including Jews, because Albania and Kosovo have had Jews since the first century in the common era. And Joe is going to tell you how they got there. From the burning of the first temple, 70 AD, Jews fled all over, came to the Balkans. The Jewish families from those days went back to Israel. I helped with Harvey Sarnoff, who wrote this book with the information we gave them, Rescue in Albania. You're going to see the beautiful connection between the Jewish and the Albanian people. Historically, not just the Holocaust that you're going to hear from Shirley. It's a wonderful story. And sure enough, the Spanish Inquisition, more Jews came into Albania and Macedonia and those areas. And then the final refuge was from Hitler himself, and the Albanians did not give up one Jew, not the 400 families that lived there, some, for almost 2,000 years, and not one of the 2,000 that were lucky enough to escape from Yugoslavia and Western Europe, because they heard, if you get to Albania, you are saved. 
these people will risk their lives. And this is the story that's in this book. And you're all going to get a copy of this book before you leave today. Because it's not easy to tell the whole story. So how do we do this now? My wife and I are volunteers. We set up learning a lot from APAC, by the way. Don't forget, it was heavily supported by the Jewish community, went to Israel many times. And we set up exactly what the Jewish community had. I set up a uh, lobby called the Albanian American Civic League, registered under IRS code 501c4, cannot take a deduction. That's an investment for freedom for the Albanian people. And we've used that money to lobby. But Shirley and I have conducted hearings. We have them on YouTube. If you want to see us, you know, in action, just press YouTube Albanian on your body and you'll see 50 10 minute or less YouTube videos on what we've done and more are going up. Thank God I put everything on video and now it's being digitized so people can get it. Uh, but we set up the, 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 the lobby, the league, which is a lobby. Then we set up a foundation, which is what produced this book because the foundation is to educate people, not to lobby for legislation, which we did in getting resolutions. And we got the United States government, it took 25 years to endorse Kosovo as a new state. Shirley and I created a new state. How many people do you know created a new state? We did. It took 25 years. Uh, and it's got now 62 countries that have recognized it. Israel not yet. That's why we're heavily passing this around so people know there is a moral debt that the Jewish people owe to the state of Israel. You know, politics being politics, they don't want to jump yet, and they, but they should because the United States was the first to recognize this over. Okay. Israel should have been the second. But that's okay, we're gonna now make the case. We don't give up. Persistence is what pays in life, okay? So, then we have the final thing is a public affairs committee, a PAC. The Albanian American Public Affairs Committee, because you have to reward those people, as you've done, the Jewish community, who support your issues, right? You've done it with congressmen, with senators, and whatnot, we've done it. So we've taken a page from what the Jewish people have done in America, to get their voice, to be a loud voice, an effective voice for change. And thank God I went to Congress because that's one of the best things that I learned. So now you've got the situation of 600 years ago, and I just want to show you something because it's amazing. You have to see, you're going to get a geography lesson tonight and a history lesson besides, okay? And a lesson on human rights. I'm going to stay here because this little camera takes six hours of film. I do a weekly TV show on cable in my district, and you're going to be on a half hour show, we'll edit it, to show that, you know, this group was nice enough to listen. Now, look at this one. People say, Albania, oh, where is that? In the Caucasus? Is it someplace near Russia? Is it on the other side of Turkey? No, look, here is how my father's people fled the Ottoman Turks, 45 miles, closest point, closer than Key West is to Cuba and Haiti. And you can imagine in the year 1488, the boats and the rafts and whatnot, because the Albanians, held up the Ottomans from conquering Europe for 27 years. They were the army of the day. They were the army that Italy brought in the kingdom of, don't forget, Italy only was formed in 1861. We're talking about the kingdom of Naples and Sicily back then. So when they needed to overcome the French coming in this way, this, I tell my Italian friends, you'd be speaking French today, not Italian, if it weren't for the Albanians. They had to bring in the Albanian army twice to overcome the Lombards, okay? But this great general, George Castriani, you probably don't remember him or heard the name, Shirley's right on the screen, play right, play right now, it is better than Braveheart. You go to Italy, go to Budapest, go to Vienna, and ask yourself, why is his statue there, 16 feet tall with the sword on the horse? They built those 700 years ago, 200, 300, because they know he saved Europe from being Islamic. All right? Because they wore him down after 27 years, and then his son could not do after he died of pneumonia in, in uh, the year 1468. So it took another 20 years for the Turks to overrun. And now, look at these dots. Shirley and I brought National Geographic to these areas in 1999. If you want to see the story, Albanians, the people undone, look at the February 2000 issue, and you'll see a wonderful story. And why is that there? Because they called me as an expert on Kosovo. Oh, we're going to Italy, to the Straits of Otranto. We noticed there are refugees coming from Kosovo and Albania, and we'd like for you to tell us, you know, the history of these refugees and whatnot. 
and, and tell us more about this Kosovo war. We saw you on CNN. We saw you at, at Congress fighting with Senator Biden in 1998 at the Senate hearing. And he said, wait a minute. I have your subscription. You're a National Geographic. You're not a political journal. What are you doing writing about the Kosovo war? The other journals could do that. You should be writing about who are these Albanian people. And do you know that my father is Albanian from Italy? No. And do you know today there are 200,000 Italians that speak Albanian? No. Can you take us there? We'll do that. So we took them. And that's why you see my father's town, Gretschli, all these dots, 51 of them, are the Albanian-speaking villages in Italy today. These are Italians. But they never forgot. Like you never forgot who you were. You may have come from some other country. They never forgot. And my father comes here bringing that language with him and revives in me my roots originally. And I feel morally, this is my mitzvah for my father's people to be in front of you today. I was raised in a Jewish neighborhood, so I know a lot of that. <laughs> so, so here we are, 45 miles. It's an amazing story. And, and here's Albania. Now, guess what else is close to Albania? Israel. It's like going from Washington to New York, maybe a little bit longer. And what they're finding now in Albania is going to knock your socks off. It hasn't been announced yet. But for years, the University of Jerusalem has been working with the University of Toronto in Albania. There's a very unbelievable Roman settlement here that they've uncovered called Butrent, B-U-T-R-I-N-T. And as they're uncovering it, they come across a Byzantine church, first century, and they wanted to figure out what, you know, what, what, you know, what this was all about. In the excavation, they find out it was a Jewish gathering place. They didn't call them synagogues in those days. So as they, they figured this must have been from the first uh, burning of the, the first temple, just around the time of Masada, 70 uh, AD in the common era, guess what else they find? Not your socks off. Has it been announced? The oldest Jewish gathering place in the world from the burning of the first temple, 450 BC. The president of Albania ordered the road diverted and now excavating the entire site. This is down in southern Albania, a place called Vlor uh, Saranda. And it's gonna be, I believe, one of the great destinations for tourists, especially Jewish people, to see you know, what this was all about. Nothing was called a synagogue in those days. They were all gathering places for the Jewish people who fled Israel twice. 450 BC and 70 AD, and then the Spanish Inquisition. But there are Albanians here, the Jewish Albanians, they just don't forget, they didn't abandon their Jewishness. They actually had synagogues in Albania all these years, gathering places that became synagogues. But there is a group that are called the Romanians. It's in this book. I hope you read this book. You, you will be amazed. Who are the Romanians? These are the Jewish maidens from the tribe of the Kohanim that was brought to Rome as slaves, 10,000. There's Jewish blood all over Italy, okay? 10,000. Some of those ships never made it. And the wind blows from here to here. They were shipwrecked. And you see it in this book. So those never made it to Rome. They were in Albania, stayed there, and integrated with the uh, Albanian people who kept their Jewish religion. Amazing stories. So I just wanted you to see that, so you have that, and if you're interested in the National Geographic article, I have a, a card, Shirley has a card, we'll leave them here, and anything you want, you want my book, or you want that, we'll be pleased to do it. Information's power, right? Without information, and you are kind of missionaries in a way, you're gonna hopefully take this message to your friends and say, I heard something here that is so incredible, and you're gonna read Shirley's article, Jewish Survival in Albania and the Ethics of Bessa, which was published in the uh, Congress, what was it, Congress Weekly, Shirley? The Congress Monthly, it's the American Jewish Congress magazine, and it talks about a lot of things you should know. Now, don't block the camera, please. <laughs> so, the, the last thing I want to say, because I want Shirley to come up to talk about this wonderful thing, is how did we really do this? It wasn't easy for a junior member of the minority party. Don't forget, I was a Republican when the Senate and the House were controlled by Democrats, even though Reagan was president. How do you get anything done? You have to have a lot of, you have to be bold, number one, and you've got to be focused. 
and you have to have information, and you have to have good allies. I did nothing important in Congress without a Democrat, usually a liberal Democrat. John Conyers, the black American from Michigan, helped pass the CFO Act uh, and the Financial Management Act of 1990. My bill, it's the 20th anniversary next year, already saved billions of dollars. I'll be speaking about that around America next year. Uh, Barney Frank, how more liberal Democrat can you be? He introduced with me in August 1988 the Ethics Reform Bill to bring a public review board over the Ethics Committee. He didn't pass it, and they've got the same problem today. Congress wants to be judge and jury with their friends. Doesn't work. And but the piece de resistance is Congressman Tom Lantos, Jewish American, survivor from the Holocaust, born in Hungary. And I came back with the word Kosovo because I was on the uh, executive committee of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. Why? Why? Imagine being in a district with 46 synagogues and not being a human rights activist and not understanding apartheid or Soviet Jewry, or the issue of Tibet, which was Lantos' favorite issue. So when I brought this with him, because nobody knew Kosovo. He was the only one. He says, John, I was born in Hungary. I know the history of the Albanian people. I know George Castriani. I know that my landsman, Janusz Hanyadi, was his contemporary. They fought the Turks together. Tom, what do we do about this? And I told him the story that I had heard. But we had still not gotten this story. This came by accident when I brought Tom Lantos to Albania in 1990. So we worked 85, 86, 87, 88, okay? We got some resolutions in. We started preparing the people for this new age Hitler called Milosevic. Shirley and I had to go to The Hague to testify against him. On the first day, he mentions my name that gave me the right to go and testify in The Hague. And he blamed everything on me, that I was Satanizing the Serbian people, Satanizing him, but we had the facts. He was at the cleansing, and there was a genocide going on. It started in Bosnia, and it was just about to happen in Kosovo. Had I not prepared, in 1985, at least the Congress and the Senate for what was coming, because we knew there was this antipathy between the Serbs and the Albanians, and they were trying to make it a religious war, when it wasn't, it was, a, it was an, not even an ethnic thing, it was more of a uh, human rights situation that no one quite understood. So Tom and I got very close. I helped him with the Soviet Jewry area. I raised money for him. I brought him to New York many times. And he said, Joe, you know, this Albanian thing is fascinating. It's like you're bringing me back to my roots. I have one request of you. I've traveled everywhere in the world. I would like to be the first to go to Albania with you. I hear they're trying to bring you there. The communist regime did not go down with the Berlin Wall, believe it or not. A year later, that hard communist regime was still there. The nut had died five years before, and the Hozier, the psychotic person who put, you know, a wall around Albania. If you left, you were shot. If you tried to get in, you were shot. That's why there were so many, today, you're going to find the most beautiful, preserved things, because no one has been able to excavate anything for 50 years. And off coast, forget it. They didn't have the equipment 50 years ago, maybe. But even if they did, nobody would be allowed to do it. So the future of Albania is going to be a tremendous destination for the history because these boats, as I said, blow towards that direction. So there are many wrecks right off the coast of Albania, and Shirley and I got involved with that briefly as well. But I told Tom, Tom, you know, you've done so much for so many people, and look what you've done to empower me, a junior member of the minority party, on this issue. The Albanian people love you. You can be sure I will set foot in Kosovo or in Albania without you. And the occasion came uh, after the Berlin Wall came down, Albania was starting to get very nervous that they had to do something, and they were really putting pressure through their embassy on me. They wanted to honor me as the hero of the Albanian people. And I was told by my shrewd Albanian friends, they just want to own you. They will use those pictures the way they want, they will slice and dice, and it's going to look like you, who's never supported communism, are supporting this regime. Don't do it. If you're going to go, and you should go, you have to go to a city member.